we're in a section now. We're going to chapter 13. I have been waiting for this. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not joking. Chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 were all, all described one evening. This is Jesus on that final evening in the upper room serving Passover and wait, and then he will, he will go out of that room across the Kidron Valley and wait in the Garden of Gethsemane for the, for the religious police to come and arrest him. So John, dear uh, Apostle John, had the good sense to write down what he said. And so he wrote down uh, all of that material. I'll tell you what I'm excited about. In these first 12 chapters, I have had a sense, as I've learned about Jesus in his relationship to the Father, that I never had before. I mean, I understood some theology, but as, as I've read through these chapters, I, I have a much deeper sense of the Father and the Son and how they work together. This is precious. It'll change. It's changed me, and I will never think the same again. I, and, I anticipate in these next chapters understanding the Holy Spirit uh, because much is taught. Some of the most important passages uh, Jesus teaches on the Holy Spirit are in these chapters that we, we're coming into. And... Uh, I, I wish I could say I, I knew all of that I'm going to read. Hey, I, I am learning right along with you. And so I anticipate the Holy Spirit teaching us uh, at a new level about his ministry and who he is to us. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And so, Father God, we, we open our hearts. We would have your beloved son disciple us. Lord Jesus, you are the Lord of the church. You are our rabbi. And we would follow you and listen to you. We bring to you today... Open ears, open eyes to see the things of God. We bring you tender hearts that do not rebel, but would receive that which is from you. And I pray for the grace to get out of the way, Lord, to let you be our teacher. Let you be our master. Let you disciple us. We want to be like you. So come now. Teach, heal, comfort, strengthen, pierce our hearts, Lord. If there's wounds, break through them. May the word of God do its work in all of us. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. All right, we'll start at chapter 13, verse 1. And I'm going to read down to 5, and then I'm going to skip some, which we'll pick up another time, and go down to verse 12. Now, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Would you say he loved them to the end? Yeah, we'll see what that means. That's a powerful statement John makes. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. Would you say, come forth from God? Going back to God. Got up from supper and laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. And then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And then, yes, we have this encounter with Peter, and we will look at it another time. Peter, Peter has a response. Pick up at verse 12 again. So when he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Come, Holy Spirit. Let's look at our discussion guide. Washing feet. On that final evening in the upper room, Jesus did something that turned our world upside down. Normally, humans think that the more important a person is, that the more that person should be served and honored. We think important people are too dignified to do lowly tasks. 
We look for ways to give them special care. We give them the best seat, the best portion, the best of everything. They become the focus of our attention and adulation. So it is no wonder humans strive to become important. In countless ways, in countless areas of life, people everywhere maneuver, compete, and even battle for position. They want to become important and enjoy the rewards that come with it. But on that final evening in the upper room, Jesus did something that turned all of that upside down. He, the Lord and teacher, picked up a towel and a wash basin and washed his disciples' feet. The most important person in the room, the most important person in the world, did the lowliest act of service. He did what a household servant would normally have done in most homes. He washed their dusty feet. His humility was shocking. It felt inappropriate. It made everyone uncomfortable. It was awkward. Let me stop a second. Let me just put this in perspective. Um, you, you haven't seen much of the sun in a while. And so you haven't walked on anything that's dusty. Uh, but when you get into the Middle East, it's hot and it's dusty. And you wear sandals. And uh, lots of people just did. And one of the first things they would do when they get back to their room is wash their feet. Uh, they're, they're not only sweaty, but you get, you get the sweat, and then you get the dust, and that pro produces a clay. Pardon me for being explicit, but you get this kind of goo and clay and junk all over your feet. It's just really, really special. <laughs> so the first thing anybody would do when you came to a house and you want their feet washed, <laughs> you don't want those feet in your house, if <laughs> nothing else. And so, you know, you're, you're, you, the household servant or whatever will take a bowl and all, and, and when, the, when the guest comes, you wash their feet as they enter the house. So here is everybody with these dirty feet. And Jesus gets up, and he washes all that filth off their feet. I just want you to understand, this is not just a gesture. It's a very uh, unpleasant task. Uh, you're washing those dirty feet. The man, the man many in Israel believed was the promised Messiah. The man with such power he could still a storm and raise dead people to life. The man who, so skilled in his knowledge of the scriptures that he could silence the nation's most senior religious leaders. The man who couldn't step into the, a public place without thousands rushing to hear him and trying to touch his cloak. Knelt down. And one by one, with his hands, washed the dust and sweat off of his disciples' feet. There can be little doubt that they watched him in stunned silence. Each disciple must have glanced at the others with that questioning look which asks, what is he doing? Peter, of course, broke the silence and tried to resist, but was quickly corrected. Well, that another sermon. Then when he had finished, Jesus returned to his place at the table and said this. Would you read this out loud with me? Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example, a pattern to be copied that you should also do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. He wants us to do that, doesn't he? On that final evening in the upper room, he modeled the attitude which must be in every true disciple. A love for God and others that is so strong that it causes us to cast aside our desire for honor and gladly take up the lowliest places of service. I'll read that again. The attitude which must be in every true disciple. A love for God and others that is so strong it causes us to cast aside our desire for honor and gladly take up the lowliest places of service. He said if, we, if he could do such humble service, then surely we, his disciples, could do the same. Since we love him and desire to obey him, let's try to discover what it means to wash one another's feet. Let me say, you know, we, we talk about 
about the mistakes and the failures of, of portions of the Christian church over history. But I want you to know that all through uh, history, true Christian men and women have done the most humble foot washing all over the planet. Uh, if you go to many, many cultures, uh, uh, one group, for example, that is always the outcast and no one wants to care for. They're literally herded into groups and left, left to just fend for themselves in misery are, are lepers. Uh, leprosy now we're beginning thanks to a Christian man named Paul Brand who, who uh, became a doctor and gave up everything and went and studied leprosy uh, for this very reason. Uh, uh, but thanks to him, there's all kinds of medical understanding and breakthrough now about how to, how to treat leprosy and what it is. But it was a, it was a pariah status, uh, even in the United States, by the way. We had camps in, in Louisiana and places where we would put people in with barbed wire fences and guard towers. Yeah. If you contract that disease, you are immediately a, a, almost a criminal. And you have no freedoms left. You're stuck in that camp, and, and you, are, you are left there. Um, uh, because they just, they're terrified. They're just terrified of the disease. Well, that's always been the case. So who has it been? And, and I know this firsthand. Uh, when Mary and I, way back in 1970, 71, were part of a, a tour uh, with a, about 30 students and a professor. We went around the world for five months. And uh, we had to do a, st a study. Our particular professor was a biology professor. And so you had to do something on human ecology. And uh, I did sewage treatment in, in Japan, which was, frankly, fascinating. Uh, I'd love to tell you about it sometime. <laughs> I would. It, it was impressive. However, that was my project. Her, my wife's project, I, we weren't married yet, but uh, my wife's project was leprosy treatment around the world. And then I, I had a camera, so I became her, I, I would go wherever they would go and take pictures for her. And she and another nurse, uh, she was a nurse training, uh, she and another nurse went, went and uh, investigated. We, we, inv we went, went through in Ethiopia, we went to the hospitals. We did grand rounds in the Addis Ababa. That was so cool. Um, in, in the hospital, we, we, we went to leprosy treatment in India. We were, we were in just numerous places. And so I've watched it. I know what I, I know. I've seen it firsthand. And in every case, it was Christian. It was, in fact, uh, in, in, uh, it, it, it's Christians because they are willing to care for the least. They are willing, they, they, what do we see? What is it that changes us? Are we being polite? No, not at all. We understand, one, the eternal value of this person. Just, they have a disease, but they're loved dearly by God. You, you sang about it. Craig spoke about it. God loves people. He's made them in his image, and they, everyone is eternally precious. We get that. We get that the, the, the person, even with, with mental uh, damage or disorder, is dearly loved of God. So we have a value system, one, that sees people as Deeply valuable, regardless of their productivity. You see that? And secondly, we have an instruction. Our master has told us to humbly do the things no one else wants to do. He said that's the way he's treated us, and we're to treat each other and others that way. So we have this, we have this thing. So you go to leprosy things, and there are doctors and nurses and people who give their whole lives to orphans, to lepers, uh, to the... To, 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 to AIDS, to all sorts of things all over the world. And it's going on today. It's going on today as we speak. People are doing such things. Why? We're disciples. And our master has gone before us. And he said, I, want, I wash your feet. I want you to wash one another's feet. Would you turn to uh, your daily Bible study? I am only doing one day. Yeah, it's just because all the others about something else. So yeah, nothing restrained in me. It's just logic. Saturday. Passover that year began on Thursday evening. The other gospels record that preparations for the celebration were made earlier in the day. A furnished room had been secretly secured by Jesus. He had, been sent, he had sent Peter and John ahead to prepare the room and the meal. A lamb had to be purchased, presented to the priests in the temple for inspection, slaughtered there, and then taken back to the house to be cooked. Unleavened bread, wine, bitter herbs, and other elements used in the feast were also purchased. While Peter and John were busy doing these things, Jesus and the rest of the disciples spent the day elsewhere. Jesus deliberately hid them 
pardon me, hid from them, the, the ten, the location of the meeting site, so that Judas Iscariot could not report their location to the priests until after the meal had been eaten and Jesus had been able to present his final teachings and pray for them. I want you to see that. Remember how you've heard Jesus say it. I mean, if you've read through, he'll say, I have, I have desired to have this meal with you, this Passover. This, this evening was special to him. This is my last evening with you, and I'm maximizing it. Uh, and so he, he takes that Passover meal, and then he teaches right through the evening, right till probably 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning, and then he goes across and he begins to prepare himself uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, for what's, what's ahead for him. He, we have a problem. Judas Iscariot has already decided to betray him. Judas has already been to the priests and made a deal. For 30 pieces of silver, he will, he will disclose the location of Jesus. They'd like to arrest him on Passover. Uh, this is a, everyone in town is in their houses. Uh, every, the, all the families are gathered. Everything, people are all over. It's a quiet, uh, solemn night where people are having having Passover feast and family gatherings, so no one's in the streets. So they can take a, 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 a uh, religious police, because that's who it was. It wasn't Romans that went and arrested him. It was not the Romans. It was the, it was the temple police, uh, Le Levitical police. And they came and they, uh, you know, with clubs and torches and everything else, but they can go through the quiet streets. So Judas wants to know where is this going to happen. So if, if you've noticed a strange story, you might not have understood it when you read it. Jesus says to Peter and John, he says, all right, I want you to go into the city and I want you to prepare the Passover meal. And he says, I, 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 I want you to go and, and as you go, you'll find a, a man with a, a, a water jar on his head. Remember this? Well, what's unusual about that? Well, the women generally got the water. And so you've got a man carrying a water jar. That'll stand out. You don't even tell him who it is. Because you can imagine that, 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 that Judas is sitting here trying to find out where are you going to meet? Because once he has that information, he can somehow excuse himself for some reason, report the location, and that would be the end of the evening. They would, they would arrest him and he would not be able to serve. Aren't we grateful we have, he served communion? You know, he explained the bread and the cup that evening. I'll show you some of the things he did. It's just a, a wonderful evening. And so all of that would have been eliminated. So Jesus says, I'm not going to let you do that, Judas. Uh, I'm going to trick you. And so he, he just says, you go into these two, and you'll find a guy with a water jar, and he'll show you an upper room. Well, I think I know who the guy with the water jar was. I think it's John Mark. John Mark is a young man, and his mother, Mary, owns the house that has the upper room. Uh, we encounter her, actually, in Acts chapter 12. I think it's Acts 12, 12. Uh, and, and there, there is a mother, the mother of the house, and John Mark is her, her son. Um, so I think John Mark probably has the water jar going, can we get this over with? You know, I hope nobody sees me. You know, so he's got the water jar and all, and then when they come, uh, he leads them into the house. What do they have to do? Well, they need to make sure there's plates and whatever else for everybody, and all of that's set up in the room. It's, uh, it's, it'll be set up a, probably a, a triclinium kind of table and all. They have to go get the lamb. Now, here's the deal. They've got to go and buy a lamb. It's got to be a spotless lamb. It's got to be big enough so everybody can eat, but not so big that anything's left over. This, this is not dinner. This is a sacrifice. It's a holy thing. That, that's Passover lamb is treated very holy. Uh, in fact, anything left over is burned. No, you don't throw it away. It's not dinner. Uh, it's, it's, your, it's your atonement. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a very special thing. So they, 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 they will buy a lamp. They will take it to the temple, and that'll be quite a wait. Um, on an average Passover, you've got 250,000 lambs that'll be inspected by the priest. They have to be, they have to be uh, seen. So you've got priests lined up. I mean, this is, a, this is an operation, you know, and so you're lining up, and you know, they'll see that. And then you will slaughter the lamb there at the temple. There's hooks and things, and you'll hang the thing, and you'll, you'll slaughter it. You'll, you'll offer it to the Lord, cut its throat, all of that. And then you'll take its carcass, and you'll hang it, and you'll, you'll take the wool off and the entrails out and all of that kind of thing. And then they, I think they put them on a willow bough or something. You would take this cleaned carcass now and put it on a willow bough. And they would have taken that lamb then back to the house. And they, now they've got to roast it. 
So it's got to be cooked and ready um, by the time everybody arrives. So that's what Peter and John are doing. So they're having a very full day. But no, and then Jesus takes the rest of them somewhere. But no one in the ten knows where they're going until Jesus leads them in there. And then poor Judas is trapped. He's stuck in the room figuring, how do I get out of here? And he's trapped. Even in that, even in that evening, knowing perfectly well who's going to betray him, Jesus, would you notice, no one knows who's going to betray him except Jesus. Jesus has done nothing to indicate some kind of disapproval or sourness toward, toward Judas. He knows he's stealing money. He knows all of this is going on. He does nothing. He, he keeps, and even in that evening, I'll show it to you later because it's later in this chapter. He will offer to Judas, it says, King James says, the sop. That sounds awful. He offers him the sop. What he's offering him is the bitter herbs. Judas is literally sitting next to him at that table at that last Passover meal. And, he, and, he, and Jesus holds up to him the bitter herbs. In other words, prophetically, Judas, where you're going is going to be very bitter. Do you really want to do this? I think he was inviting him to repent. Don't you? Yeah. And I know you can say, well, he was, uh, he was a son of perdition. Um, if you think God created him so he could damn him, you're just not thinking about the same God I know. It, no, he didn't. Now, he knew what would happen. But it, all through it, Judas is being given invitation to repent, Judas. Repent. And it says that when Judas reject, took the sop, that the devil entered him. So as he went, he flared. The anger came up. And he, he, not only a demon entered him, Satan entered him. There's only one other example of that, and that's the Antichrist. I mean, this, this man really gets it. It's ugly. Anyway, we'll stop there. Let's go back to our, to our text. What Jesus knew. John actually lets us know what Jesus was thinking before he washed his disciples' feet. Let me, let me just read it again so you hear this. L listen to this. John's telling us what went through Jesus' mind before he served that meal. It says, before the feast of the Passover, Je Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, so he knows that, that he would depart out of this world to the Father. He knew that. Uh, it says there that he, uh, Ju Judas uh, was going to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, so he knows, and he knows that. He knows that he has all authority. Then he, he knows that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. Do you see that? Why does he tell us that? He says, knowing these things, he got up from supper, took a towel, wrapped it around his waist, and washed their feet. Knowing this, he did this. All right, let's look at our text. John says he knew, number one, that his hour had come. That means Jesus was fully aware not only of God's plan, but of God's timetable. He knew he would be arrested that night and executed the next day, which means his actions that evening are all the more amazing. Rather than withdrawing to a solitary place so that he could prepare himself for what was to come, he would do that for an hour at the end, he spent most of that evening caring for his disciples. That selflessness is what John is pointing to when he says he loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. Isn't that beautiful? Look at our master. Knowing he's going to be savaged before the night is over. Knowing this, rather than pull away and sort of take care of himself, he pours into them, serves them communion, washes their feet, teaches them with all his heart. That's who's, that's who's your Lord. He loves you, and he'll give it to the end. He loved them to the end. He didn't waste a minute. Hallelujah. Jesus carefully arranged to have those, who find, uh, those final hours undisturbed so that he could serve his disciples' Passover and explain the bread and the cup. He wanted to, pre to prepare them for his departure. He wanted to talk to them about heaven, the Holy Spirit, peace, fruitfulness, persecution, his return, and their new authority in prayer. He wanted them to listen while he prayed for them. Knowing that he was about to die, Jesus didn't think about himself. He thought about them. Number two, John says Jesus knew where he was going after he died. 
he would return to his place of honor beside the Father. As shameful as the cross might be, glory and honor awaited him on the other side. He knew where he was going. He knew he had come from heaven, and he knew he was going to heaven. He would be right back in the glories of the Father. Number, number three, Jesus, Jesus knew that Judas had already decided to betray him. Yet he did not hesitate to reach out to Judas up until that final moment when Satan entered into him. That evening, he washed Judas' feet along with all the rest. Number four, Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands. Jesus was no victim. He voluntarily gave his life for us. The Father had already given him complete authority. Remember where he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And then he says to us, go therefore. I'll go with you. With that authority, you go. He had complete authority over all creation and the freedom to act as he willed. He could have escaped at any moment, yet he freely chose to endure the cross. That is a very important point. For his atonement to be for us, for, his to, for it to be a true atonement that really takes the sin of the world, he had to do it freely. You can, you can talk about the, the sacrificial animals, but I want to guarantee you, those animals don't really do it voluntarily. Now, I, I admit, sheep are pretty dumb, and they don't know where they're headed. You know, so, bah, you know, and then you, uh, but that's ignorance. That, that, ain't, that, that isn't like him saying, oh, great, go ahead, you know. They're simply victims. Jesus was not a victim. He gave himself to the very last moment. He gave himself. Peter, Peter takes the sword out and lops the guy's ear off. Jesus says, I could call for 12 legions of angels at any moment I want. He puts the ear back on and lets them arrest him. He was no victim, knowing that all things had been put into his hands, that he had all this authority. He washed their feet. He chose to wash their feet. Number five, John says he knew that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. He fully understood that he was God's divine son. Did you see that? He came forth from God. He was God's divine son who had, not, who had been sent to earth. And that after his death and resurrection, he would return to the glories of heaven. His identity and his future were secure. He understood, I am the prince of heaven. I am the divine son of God. And I've come from heaven. May I point out that's not insecurity? This man does not have low self-esteem. Uh, this is important. He does not have low self-esteem. So what Jesus did. So Jesus, knowing those things, Jesus chose, number one, to spend this final evening caring for others rather than himself. Number two, to model the humility with which he wanted all of his disciples to serve each other. And three, to show his disciples the attitude which makes a person great in God's sight. A few weeks earlier, he had said this. Would you read this with me out loud? You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. As I read that, I believe we are actually seeing that, that humility is a fundamental part of the heart of God. Isn't that remarkable? The creator of heaven and earth, the one who can say, let there be, and boom, you have, you have the universe, is humble. Ha, how do you do that? There's a humility in him, in the heart of God, this humility that's being expressed. Jesus knew who he was. He was not insecure. He was confident. He was, he was secure. 
He understood his position. He understood his future. He understood his origin. He understood all of these things. And knowing those things, he was released to serve at the lowest, humblest level. Why Jesus did it? Jesus' greatness did not prevent him from serving others. In fact, it allowed him to do the lowliest job with no loss of dignity. He didn't wash their feet because he was insecure. John showed us what was in his mind at the time, and it wasn't low self-esteem. You following me? And he wasn't angry. I've often heard it played that way. He didn't grab a towel, a bowl and a towel, and start scrubbing their feet, muttering that since no one else was going to do this dirty job, apparently he would have to. Isn't that the way we often play that thing? No one did it. Yeah, nobody cleaned their feet. So he got them going, well, if you won't, I will. You know, and he, <laughs> he pulls his heart and scrub it. <laughs> it's not what went on. John tells us why he did it. He did it because he, he says because he loved them. He loved them to the end. He was loving them. He wanted to, and he says, I wanted to teach you something. I want to model something you'll never forget. I want an attitude in you. I want you to see this attitude. I'm going to model it for you. That, that was no accident. It wasn't a leftover like, well, I guess somebody's got to clean these feet. This was an intentional moment of discipleship. John says he did it because he loved them. There was a need for feet to be washed, and it was not beneath him to do it. Actually, washing their feet was a small thing compared to what he was about to do. He would soon be hanging on a cross, washing away their sin. If you think washing the dust is bad, how about taking the sin of the world? I mean, just stop for a moment. He, I love Paul, he who knew no sin, Paul says, became sin for us. Here, I mean, here is, a, here is a tender heart, a pure heart, who has never felt guilt. He's never done anything. He's been with the Father forever, and then as a man, he's been sinless. He's never felt guilt. There's a naivete, if you want to say it. He's not, he doesn't know what you and I know. <laughs> we know what guilt feels like. We know what shame feels like. We, we got that one down. He didn't. And then hanging on the cross, he became the most wretched individual in history. All the sin of the world was piled on him, and he became morally responsible for it. This isn't just a figurative thing. He be, it, the, it fell upon him. That's why Paul says it the way he did. He, he who knew no sin became sin for us. He became, he became the, 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 as though he were the source of it all. That's why he cried out, oh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What had never been before in all of, all of eternity was now a complete separation as the father turned his back on what was now the vile source of sin. And washing feet <laughs> is nothing compared to taking the filth of our sin. Where did I end up? Am I washing? Yeah. That final evening in the upper room, teaches us something very important. Jesus shows us that selfless acts of service are not done by people who feel badly about themselves. They are done by people who are so confident in the dignity God has given them that, they can't, that, that what they do can't diminish who they are. I'm going to do it again. That was good, and I wrote that. <laughs> yes. Every, you know, there's always one line or two that was actually worth saying. So that selfless acts of service are not done by people who feel badly about themselves. This isn't for doormats. This isn't for people who are said, so, well, I might as well. I mean, I'm the, you know, what, it doesn't matter what happens to me anymore. You know, that kind of, that's, that's, men, that's mental and emotional uh, trouble. That is not what God is asking for us. They are not done by people who feel badly about themselves. They are done by people who are so confident in the dignity God has given them that, they, that what they do can't diminish who they are. A Paul Brand who could have been, he was a fellow in the Royal College of, of Surgeons and, 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 and wanted it at, at any medical school in America, leaves all of that aside and goes to India. 
and spends his life uh, pouring. He came back and actually did it in the United States too with, with our leprosy columns later on in his life. But he goes back and just says, this is wrong. This treatment of people like this, this degrading of people just because they get a disease and, and turning them into criminals somehow. This is horrible. It's got to stop. He gives his life to that. He, is, he, he, he goes through all that there is. There's no money in this. There's no nothing in this. That's foot washing, people. That's foot washing. Not because Paul Brand's insecure. He's one of the smartest guys probably at the, in, the, at the, in the world at the time. Compassionate, comes up with all of the research, the research and the understandings we have now. That, that man and his, and his wife, she was also a physician, mad. Those, those two came up with it. They worked it through. They just figured it out. Why? Not money, not insecurity. This, that loving heart that says, I'm going, I'll happily care for the things no one else wants to do. I'll happily reach the people no one else wants. I'll happily, where the love of God constrains me. And it doesn't diminish me in any way. It didn't diminish Jesus to wash their feet. He wasn't any less the Savior. He wasn't any less the Lord of heaven. But the love in him, the humility in him, just easily did that. That's what he's looking for from us. He says, I do this to give you an example. I want you to do. I'm greater than you. You're right. I'm your master. You're right. If I can do it, you can do it. Did you hear him say that? Yeah, that's exactly what he meant. It's, exa- it's actually very difficult for someone who is insecure to serve others. Low self-esteem aches to be honored. Every selfless act stirs shame and awakens the fear that someone will watch and despise us. The person who's insecure, the person who feels badly about themselves, just is miserable when asked to do something uh, humble. Uh, they feel uh, they've been, they've been uh, uh, demoted, uh, or they'll talk about, uh, uh, you're going to make me into a doormat. Uh, there's all kinds of raw fear and raw insecurity that just screams uh, when asked to do these kinds of things in the insecure person. A person who doesn't know who they are in God a person who hasn't discovered the authority and freedom that has been given them to it in Christ. You know, every so often the Lord will just say to me, you know, I, I just realize I don't have to do this. I am not a slave. I am his son. And it is a free choice to give my time or my life to whatever he's asking me to do. I don't have to do that. You don't either. We're not slaves. Paul says that so beautifully. He says, you know, he's not giving you a spirit of of slavery uh, leading to fear again. But you have been given the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Isn't that beautiful? We do this because we we want to. (laughs) Because now we want to. We want to follow our, our Lord. It has been given to them in Christ, a person who is not sure of the honor that awaits them in heaven. We'll find it very painful to do tasks that go unrecognized. You know, I have people say, well, nobody really appreciates this. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, the more honor you get, the less, the less Jesus there. Apparently, he says, he says, it's the things, don't let the left hand know what the right hand's doing. You and I should be giving to people financially and it's in other ways, and, and they shouldn't have a clue where it came from. And no one will ever know. You do it because it's, the love of Christ in you. you, you do, your Lord sees. You, you get that. This is, and, and you're not even looking for some kind of reward. You know what our greatest reward is? Our greatest reward is people think, well, you're going to get crowns in heaven. Oh, that'll be great. You know. <laughs> do, do you, want, you, want a, you want an ornament, do you? You know what your crown is? You know what your, the jewels are? People. Your reward in heaven is watching that person who found Jesus because of you or you helped heal so that he or she could go on in their calling. The gems are those sparkling eyes that come up and say, I don't know how to thank you for what you did, for the influence you were. You didn't realize I watched you like a hawk. And I saw a lot of hypocrisy, but I saw you. 
And you let me know this is real. And I couldn't get away from it. I had a young man come up to me uh, just before I went to Israel. And this had been a very unpleasant situation. Uh, in fact, I used him in a sermon illustration, but I won't tell you which one it was. He, he knew. <laughs> and he came up to me and he says, Pastor Steve, and he, he, I'll tell you, he was going to leave his family. He came up with his family and, and I can tell by his wife, she, you always look at the wife or the husband, you can tell by the eyes, she was beaming. And he said to me, he said, I tried to get away from it, but he said, God kept talking to me and it was always in your voice. <laughs> Now, that'll haunt you right there. <laughs> it, because I'm the one, you know, I, he'd been trying to rationalize that, oh, grace covers all of this, and I can do all of this. And I said, my foot, you'll be a, you'll be a perpetually unrepentant adulterer and go to hell. Woof, did that light him up. Came out of his seat and couldn't get away from it. That, I, I came, I hugged him. I said, you have no idea how grateful I am. You made my month. You made my year. That's your reward in heaven. That's your reward in heaven. You don't want something on your head. You want, you want eyes that sparkle. You want people that because of you know their Lord or are healed or comforted or find their calling. Oh. Oh. Our feet. That's why before we wash someone else's feet, we need to let Jesus wash ours. We need to know that our sins are forgiven. We need to know that we have been clothed with authority and have the privilege to minister in his name. We need to know that we are God's children and that he honors us no matter what others may think. That knowledge releases us to do the very things no one else wants to do. One another. One final observation. Jesus certainly wants us to wash the feet of those who don't know him yet. But he didn't say that here. He said that in the parable of the Good Samaritan and, and numerous other places. So we have that instruction as well to go to the uttermost parts of the earth. But he didn't say that here. On that final evening, he told his disciples to wash one another's feet. Would you say one another's feet? Meaning that we are to selflessly serve other believers. Apparently, he assumed that each of us would need our feet washed from time to time. And if we don't care for each other, why would anyone want to become part of the church of Jesus Christ? Later that evening, he said this, and would you read this with me? By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. That was said literally within the hour. I asked Mary I, I, yesterday, I said, help me through this. Where do you see foot washing? Where do you see disciples washing disciples' feet? And she just started rattling it off. She started with the altar workers. I saw some of you come today and, and need prayer, and someone would slip up and lay their hand on you and pray for you and minister to you. Is that washing feet? Yeah, is it washing one another's feet? It certainly is. Intercessors, you know, there are people in the church every week uh, spending hours praying over the, when you put a prayer request in or, the, or just the uh, other, other kinds of intercessors, interceding over us constantly. I am so grateful. Uh, some of it's just not even formal. Uh, people will come up and say, Pastor Steve, I just want you to know I pray for you every day. You have no idea how grateful I am. By the way, I pray for you too every day. Wednesday evening prayer, you can come on Wednesday evening and you can come with your disease. You can come with, a, with, a, with demonic harassment and torment. You can come longing for the Holy Spirit. You can come in with whatever and there will be people who will devote themselves prophetically. They prayed up. They've been praying for hours before you get there. They prepare themselves and they will serve you and minister to you. They're washing your feet. We have Stephen ministers, 50 to 60 Men and women in this church will give an hour a week, every week, to those who are lonely and troubled, to those who are in hospital, 
to, the, to those who are shut in and have no one who comes. They will come and love them and be with them. Over 50% of the pastoral care of this church is given by the people of this church. Is that, is that foot washing? Oh, is it ever? Are we loving one another? Exactly what he's talking about. Royal family uh, kids camp. Those, those children, people are giving up a, a week of vacation. For years, they paid their own fees as well, which was, was, is sizable. Uh, they paid their own camp fees. They gave up a week of vacation. And they went basically sleepless and, and, and allowing some uh, broken child to rage at them as, as necessary and, and, and restraining them so they don't hurt somebody or themselves. Uh, going through all of that, reaching a point of breakthrough. Uh, in that child, uh, where the love of God is there. Uh, that's washing feet. Now, some of those children don't know the Lord, and some of them come from homes where they sort of maybe do, but they're really, really in need. Track, um, I, I think that was just mentioned, Fire and Ice, we're raising f money for that. What's that? Teen Reach Adventure Camp. You take young teens, and you take boys with boys and girls with girls, and you take th it's three intense days and reach out and love those, those young people. Who, who was it? Somebody was cutting somebody's hair in this church. And the young lady who was cutting hair, was, they were talking, and she says, well, I've got this, I'm going to Royal Family Kids Camp. And the young lady says, where's that? And, and this was it, it's, um, not, not, in, not in town. And, and, and she said, uh, well, and down in Federal Way, she said, well, I went to a Royal Family Kids Camp when I was little in Federal Way. And she said, I still have my memory book. Come on. That's foot washing people. That, this, see, it's those kinds of things. I, I'll st uh, let me go fast, but don't, don't leave me. Children's ministry. Last night, we had, a, we had a, par a parents council for the children's ministry. And one parent after another said, my child just loves coming here now. Uh, we had a couple of parents with special needs children saying, my child loves to come. And I just went, Yes! Because we have programs where some of you will just take a special needs child and spend the time with them so they're loved. The one mom, mom was just tears running out in her face. Saying, you know, you go to churches and children, are, special needs children are just not, you know, don't work well. And then she says, my, my, my son just loves to be here. He just looks forward to be here. And he says, your people are so nice. That's huge. That is huge. Oh, I was... That's foot washing. And when, you, when, we, when we love like that, it's the most powerful force on earth. Youth, food pantry. You, there's some of you, you, you don't just put food on the table and say, here's food for some of the poor. You feed on like 160 families every two weeks. You, you don't do it. You dress it up. It looks like, look like, like Starbucks. I mean, it's all jazzed up and... And there's prayer circles and things going on and translations. And there's just, just this love is poured out. It's dignified. It's beautiful. You've been doing it for years. I can't remember how long is when we started it. That's washing feet. Many of them are Christian people who come too from different communities. And you're washing their feet. And I tell you, every so often, I hear from other church pastors and other, uh, from other communities. And you have a huge reputation. They love you. The whole community loves you. Life groups, worship, you know the worship team? They give hours and hours, each one. These are volunteers, all of them. Except we have one or two people who have to make lists, um, but everybody else is, is volunteering. Summer mission, medical missions around the world. Uh, I was thinking foster parents, adoption, on and on and on. It's, it's funny. The most powerful things in the world are the most humble and the most unrecognized and the things no one else wants to do. See, when people think ministry, they often think titles and stand in front of people. I'm telling you, the world is, there's so much ministry opportunity. It it's just makes, makes you weep. And then when one of you and when I'm at one of us will step up and just begin to do what God gives you to do, it leaves a lasting legacy. I could say in this message, okay, everybody, time to, time to do it. The thing about Northwest, and, and I'm not just flattering you, m almost all of you, as I look around, are doing such things. Just think, where is God using you with washing feet? Where is he doing it? 
I guess the word for you is Jesus sees it. Jesus sees what you're doing. You know, it, what, what better message for Mother's Day? Is there anybody who washes feet more than mothers and grandmothers? I mean, that, they're the ones who will always be there in the humble hours. This is how you change the world. He said, if I, your Lord and Master, can do this, then you do what I do. You're right, I am greater than you. This isn't beneath me to do the lowliest job in the house. And he says, now you're my disciples. You do the same. Lord Jesus, we hear you loud and clear. And we simply bless you, Lord, that because we know who we are, we know where we're going. We know our authority. We know we are sons and daughters of the living God. We are not slaves. We, and because of the love of God in us, constrains us. We gladly will wash the feet you put in front of us. And do it without recognition. To do the hard things, the difficult things, the patient things. That you might heal and restore. Grace us, O oh God. Grace us. And with all our hearts, Jesus, we will just end with this. You have washed our feet. You have washed our sin. And you continue to cleanse us. You have not stopped your ministry. We, with all our heart, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, we pray. You agree with my prayer? Would you say amen? amen? Now may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace. Shalom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.